Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Vermont Pitch Challenge, Entrepreneurial Exchange number four, Insights from Entrepreneurs. Uh, tonight, featuring a guest I've had the pleasure of speaking with before, who I think you're going to enjoy for a variety of reasons, Brogan Morton, founder of Wildlife Imaging Systems, LLC. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him uh, before he gives a presentation that I think will help a lot uh, a lot of students who are con uh, considering or already have um, uh, entered an inquiry about this pitch challenge. So far, over 200, by the way, have already uh, submitted inquiries. Um, but prior to that, I'd like to just uh, give you a little background on the pitch challenge. Uh, I'll be your host tonight, John Rydell. I've had the pleasure of working uh, at the University of Vermont, who's sponsoring this, as well as CFES Brilliant Pathways, a nonprofit that's partnering with UVM on this uh, this great project, uh, an opportunity for students to uh, enter this pitch challenge. Um, just a couple of dates to go over. The next uh, entrepreneurial exchange will be on January 9th, um, and that'll be on how to create a compelling and successful pitch. Plus, we'll speakers from UVM uh, Academic Research Commercialization Program ton of experience in the area, good tips for you as you're building your, uh, your uh, at, you know, putting in your application, which January 15th is when that that opens. So you'll be able to actually submit your uh, your application at that time. So today today's uh, presentation, I think we'll give you some tips in, in uh, helping you how to do that. And then uh, just one, a couple other things I'd like to mention, in case you're not aware, Grand prize is full a full scholarship to UVM tu tuition comprehensive fees. That's uh, it's a pretty pretty impressive uh, offering from UVM. There, uh, shout out to JJ, who's the vice pro uh, vice provost of enrollment management for uh, putting a lot of this together and uh, offering these prizes. Second prize being five thousand dollars. Third, one thousand. Um, last thing I'll say: eligible tenth, eleventh, and twelfth graders. Uh, your business plan will be judged by UVM students using the following criteria. Does a product or service offer a solution to a problem faced in the target market? Uh, you're going to hear from our guest tonight about a little bit about the importance of that. Does the product or service create a positive impact? Uh, is it creating something different in the market? And how effectively does a plan achieve your stated goals? So that's uh, some of the some of the rules for it. Uh, a little bit of background. Without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Brogan Morton, a mechanical engineer and uh, founder of Wildlife Imaging Systems, LLC, uh, leading provider adva of advanced machine vision uh, solutions to further the conservation of wildlife. I'll let him explain a little more about what that is, but formerly a senior product manager at NRG Systems in Hinesburg, a lot of experience in the area. Uh, there, he guided a successful development and commercialization uh, of their bat deterrent system, similar to what he's doing now, using uh, ultrasound to reduce bat mortality near wind turbines. From there, I will uh, turn it over to uh, Brogan Morton. Awesome. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to share my screen here, make sure everybody can see it. Can you see that, John? Yeah, looks good. Yep. Perfect. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. I uh, appreciate you taking the time out of your day to uh, listen to me. Hopefully, I can share so, uh, both my journey and some uh, lessons that I've learned along the way of um, becoming an entrepreneur. Um, this is less pitch focus, and this is going to be more an entrepreneurship focus and kind of what it takes to uh, have a successful startup. So uh, a little bit further on me, um, I'll just this will be really brief. Uh, I'm Brogan Morton. I'm the founder of Wildlife Imaging Systems. Um, I make my home in Vermont. <clears throat> uh, I do have a, a education as a mechanical engineer. That's kind of how I, how I started my career, but uh, meandered my way into marketing and really product development and marketing, which is is honestly a lot of what uh, entrepreneurship is all about. And I think one of the most important things is, is passions. And I put that on here because I think it's really important because if you are going to found a business and you're going to do something, it should really be something that you really are deeply passionate about because it can be a really tough journey and you'll have highs and you'll have lows. And it's really going to be your passion, I think, for what you're trying to do that kind of gets you through. And so, as John mentioned, I had worked at a company here in Vermont Energy Systems in the wind industry. I, I moved back to Vermont for you know to work in the wind industry. I was very excited. I love the outdoors. I love conservation, and I'm a big, as an engineer, a big a big STEM fan. And so, I'm kind of lucky enough to have passions that uh, all aligned and came together in the in the job that I had, and now the job that I actually have as a founder. So, a little bit about Wildlife Imaging Systems. We were founded in 2020. 
Um, I started it in January 2020, which is most of you probably remember is just two months before the pandemic. So it was a, kind of an inauspicious time to uh, leave a, a well-paying job and decide to strike out on my own. Uh, so it was kind of interesting, but honestly, it, it, it worked out, as you can tell right now, just fine. Um, so really what we do is we're focused on bringing computer vision and machine learning technology to wildlife conservation. Uh, so we're definitely a, a high tech company. Um, We've taken a little bit of a less traditional route. I think most startups you hear about um, typically go and, and do a pitch and maybe get some uh, seed funding and then some venture capital. Uh, and we've gone a path of all non-dilutive funding. So we, uh, in a previous job that I have, I knew about this program that um, the, in essence, Department of Energy and National Science Foundation have, which is a small business innovative research grants. Um, they, any any one of the um, you know government agencies that, provides R&D dollars, uh, has to set aside part of it for small businesses exclusively. I think it's over three and a half percent. And so it's a really fantastic opportunity if you've got some tech to be able to get non-dilutive funding. In essence, they give you a grant um, and they do not take any equity and, and you can develop your product with the idea that you will probably have to go get future uh, funding from venture capital. Um, so if you get something tech focused, uh, definitely something to check out. Now, this is going to sound really strange, um, but let's start with bats. And uh, one of the reasons I, I, I keep this in here, and it's a little bit odd, it's a little bit of a bi biology lesson in the, mid in the middle of an entrepreneurship talk, is because through the journey, I have had to become a, somewhat of an expert on a topic I never imagined that I would ever have to be an expert on. So I, and it's and honestly, one of my, I should have put one of my other passions is learning. I absolutely love learning new things and all kinds of different stuff. And so I'm just going to share a little bit about, and you'll see how this all ties in a little bit later. So I don't know if you all uh, have seen a bat before. Um, I think we have ideas from movies and it's a little bit scary, right? Um, bats are actually really these tiny little, I would say in a lot of cases, these really cute little things, right? They've got the little eyes, the big ears. Um, they're actually the only flying mammal. Um, they are mammals, they're not birds. Um, and we have all kinds of different species here in North America. I think one of the coolest things about bats um, is the fact that they fly, but how do they fly, right? They actually have, uh, their wings are actually extended hands. So this is kind of pointing out all the different parts of the bat's wing. So you can see that their elbow is right here, and this is actually uh, their wrist right up here. And every one of these little uh, appendages coming out is actually one of their fingers. So their entire ring structure is actually just supported by a membrane that's actually connecting all of the their fingers together. Uh, and the, the Latin name for the, um, the, the family is actually chiroptera, which means wing hand. And a lot of people think that bats are fairly large, but I actually have a video. This is when I was um, uh, out in the field with some biologists. I don't actually handle bats myself. You have to be a trained professional. And I am not that. I am still an engineer, but I like to tag along with the biologists when they go do something cool. So this is kind of a fun little video that just shows you uh, bats that they had captured from a bridge. And so you can see they're actually just the size of your hand when they're all scrunched up, right? And they don't have their uh, wings extended. And uh, a lot of times we think, what do bats eat? And it really does depend. Most of them do eat insects like you'd think of traditionally, um, but some eat amphibians and reptiles, fish. Some are simply fruits and nectar. Um, and But one of the things that it's important to think about is they provide incredible, what uh, they are called ecological services. So there's one uh, cave in, in Texas called Bracken Cave, and it's home to, at its peak, 20 million Mexican free tail bats live there at, at, during the year. And when they go out at night, they have to pour out of this cave for hours, right? Can you imagine 20 million of anything coming out of the mouth of a cave? They pour out for hours and then they go across the landscape and they eat 200 tons of insects in one night, right? And so I like this one because it kind of puts it in more human terms. It's like eating the equivalent in the weight of 200 Volkswagen Beetle cars. That's incredible. Now, who benefits from that? Well, we certainly farmers, right? Because some of the insects that they eat are actually crop pests. So these bats are an important part of the ecosystems and actually are providing ecological services to uh, the, the surrounding areas where they actually live. So you're probably asking yourself, I came onto this to learn about entrepreneurship and what do bats have to do with anything? Why is he droning on about these bats? Um, because really uh, bats is, is where my entrepreneurial story begins. As I mentioned, I was working at a company here that was focused very much on the wind industry. 
And I was uh, actually the product manager who was in charge of any sort of system that actually went on to the wind turbine itself. We had a condition monitoring system and uh, wind sensor systems and all kinds of systems. And we were actually approached by a customer and Bat Conservation International. And they said, we have a real problem. Uh, unfortunately, wind turbines do cause the fatality of bats. And we've got this technology we think you guys should develop. So that was in 2015. And I was lucky enough to be the product manager who got the assignment to try to bring this to commercialization. And so um, we did that. And what it does is it actually are ultrasonic speakers. So I don't know if you know this, but bats, they fly at night. Uh, and so imagine flying at night in the dark. Uh, vision, while they can see things, would be a really hard way to catch an insect You know, when you're flying through the air. Um, so they actually use something called echolocation. So they create a sound, it goes out through the atmosphere, bounces off an object, and by when it comes back, they listen for how long it takes and they can judge how far away objects are. And so that's actually how they forage and orient themselves in the world. So we had this idea that said, well, if that's a primary sense that they're using, if we try to do something um, you know, clever like create a whole bunch of ultrasounds so they couldn't actually hear those echolocation returns. Uh, maybe we can actually just make them stay away from the wind turbines in the first place. And if they stay away from the wind turbines in the first place, um, then there won't be any fatalities or injuries. Because um, bats don't actually run into you know, a stationary wind turbine, right? It's actually the blades go very fast. So when a, when a wind turbine's going in full operation, the tip of the blade is actually going about a quarter of the speed of sound so fast, so very fast. And it's something that even if a bat could perceive it would not have a near a chance to actually take any, any evasive action. So that's what we did. Uh, I was part of that team. We created these ultrasonic speakers. We put them on the nacelle where all the blades connect to on the winter run. And it pushed and tried to try to push the bats away from that rotor swept area where they were in harm's way. And the, the, the technology worked, but it didn't stop all mortality. And so we were really interested in trying to get to a solution that really just solved this whole thing, just stop bats and from any having any fatality. So as any group of good uh, problem solvers, we said, well, what we need to do is we need to go out there and we need to see how we can improve it. So we went out to the field and this is what we saw. You can't see what's happening because it's dark out. And so that was our founding kind of insight which is, wow, like there's no way to understand what's actually happening here. So it's our, it was my eureka moment. So I said, hmm, why don't we just use thermal cameras to monitor bats around turbines? Now, thermal cameras are a special kind of camera. They don't sense light like a traditional camera on your iPhone or any other DSLR. Um, they actually um, sense wavelengths that are actually emitted heat. So all of us are warm, we all emit heat. And in bats themselves, because they fly and expend so much energy, are actually really hot. So we can use one of these thermal cameras, and it's actually measuring the heat signature of everything. And so bats just pop out, and it can be the middle of the night. I could show you a video of a thermal from a uh, a thermal camera, and you couldn't tell if it was day or night because it's looking for heat energy. It's not looking for light. Now, I do want to point out another thing, and I because I do think that sometimes there's a misconception. We were not even close to the first person to uh, realize. That to, to, to think of this idea. There had been researchers who had you know, done some experiments with a couple of thermal cameras around wind turbines, but we realized that there was a problem worth solving, but to solve it, you can't just you know, do research and put out a couple of cameras at a wind turbine and, and turn around a paper in a couple of years. We really had to do it at a level of scale that is not something that was really research-based. It was really something that we were um, had to focus on commercially. Which also parlays into this. I will tell you, I'll be the first one to say I'm not a, necessarily a Steve Jobs fanboy, but this is a quote that I think is really important um, because a lot of people say, hey, like I, I'm not creative, but it's important to know that creativity is not just something, you know, it's not just something that geniuses have and, and poof, it comes. Again, this quote talks about it, but it's really just putting together different things from different things. So if you're a person who likes to like understand all kinds of different things, you'll find these natural connections to things where maybe somebody has never thought about those two things together before. And it might not feel creative because it might just feel like, hey, I just saw this thing over here and this thing over here and I put them together. Um, but that is the beauty. That is a creative act. And it is important to know that if you could be seeing things just a little bit differently than everybody else and putting those two things together could be a critical insight to starting your own business. So our solution, we would take a thermal camera, 
and we place it near a wind turbine and we would focus it up. And I don't know if you, if you all know this, but if you've ever uh, been in any sort of thought about product development, it takes a really long time to do hardware. And so we said, man, that that's going to take us too long. We would, uh, we, we don't need new cameras. We just need to use cameras that are already existing and put them into novel um, solutions. So what we did is we got, uh, you can see the thermal camera is on top of this tripod here. It's got a 200 watt solar panel, a hundred amp hour battery. And so the whole thing just runs off of solar power, completely independent of the turbine. It records all of its video onto a little micro SD card. And so what we would do is we'd go every couple of weeks and swap SD cards. We can then upload all that video to the cloud where we can process all those videos into the useful analytics, right? So all of this that right now is just commercial off the shelf products that we don't even necessarily, we resell some of it, but we don't resell a lot of it. This is an image actually taken from one of the, um, the thermal videos. So you can see that we have some clouds in the background, they're light gray. I don't know if you know this, but space is very cold. And so, and so the sky actually provides an incredible backdrop um, for especially little things like bats. You can even see insects from quite a large distance on a, on a, on a really uh, clear uh, night when there's no clouds. And so what our magic is, is not taking, you know, is, is putting these things together in a smart way, but then it's a software that can take a whole bunch of video, right? So we're recording 15 hours a night. And this year we're recording at over 15 projects, over hundred wind turbines across North America. Um, that's, you know, I haven't calculated the number of hours, but it's too much video for anybody to review in any reasonable amount of time. It's just really literally impossible. And so what our software does is it goes through and it makes sure that it pulls all the important information out of the video. So one of these images down here is actually one of the things our software turns out. So it takes a 10 minute video and then it distills it down. So everything in gray is kind of what happened in the background. And then everything in yellow is actually detection. So you can actually, your eyes put it together pretty well, but you can see these different bat tracks that are happening. Right. So these are the actual bats and their flight paths around the wind turbine. Then we realized, wow, we can actually start telling what are the bats doing? So instead of it just being data, it became something that a human can also interpret, which has become something that's been incredibly valuable to us. So you always have to remember, customers, it's not just a pretty picture. It's actually a useful piece of information that a biologist can look at and make a hypothesis about why they think the bats are there in the first place. But really our solution is this, and this is a whole bunch of just code, right? And so the software and how we process it is the really the, the, the true value that we bring to the situation. You know, we, we can buy the equipment, but this, how we process it and turn it into something valuable to the customer, that's really our solution. And so uh, I'm not quite sure how this is gonna come through uh, on Zoom, but we'll give it a go. Um, this is one of the thermal videos. So this is one, you can see the wind turbines uh, must be very low wind. The blades are rotating very slowly and you can see these little white dots. And there's actually in this video up to 12 of them around the wind turbine at a time. So we found that there are periods of time where the bats are just all over the place. And those are the times that you need to avoid operating the actual wind turbine uh, if you wanna be able to reduce that mortality, which is something that you know we, we couldn't be measuring before, right? So we were really just making kind of uh, playing darts in the dark, I guess is what it comes, kind of guessing and checking. So how does this help our customers? As I mentioned, we can tell them, so this is when the bats are showing up. This is the time of year, this is the time of night. And so if you want to be able to conserve those bats, then you need to be able to stop your wind turbines during these periods of time. It also allows us, again, to understand behavior and understand why bats are there in the first place. So perhaps we can do something like either use deterrents in a, in a different manner to make them even more effective. Perhaps we can find out why they're kind of attracted and coming to, coming to the turbines in the first place and actually reduce the attractant so we can deal with less of it. So that's kind of a, I guess, a thumbnail sketch of, of the journey that kind of how I got from, you know, just focusing on wind energy to now being at this nexus of wildlife conservation and renewable energy. And as you might imagine, I've learned a, a couple a couple lessons on the way that I'd like to talk about. Um, the first one is it's so critical um, that you become problem focused, right? You meet a lot of people who fall in love with their solution. They think they've got this cool new widget that they built. And you ask them, yeah, but what is it? You know, how does it help somebody? And, and sometimes they can't answer that fundamental question. And I will, I will tell you this right now. No one will care about your idea unless it solves their problem. It's really important that you're focusing on how this thing is going to be used by someone else. 
So I have a couple uh, things under here, which is uh, maybe types of problems to focus on or ways to think about the problems. This is one that I picked up even just this year, which is um, create an aspirin, not a vitamin. Uh, do something that relieves that's something that's a real headache to somebody right now. It's actually causing them a pain. It's such an inconvenience. It's, it's, it's something that they just don't like dealing with. They're going to be much more likely to adopt your solution than something like a vitamin. You know, uh, we're coming into the time of year, but maybe gym memberships are maybe a little bit easier to sell. But, you know, the idea of like having to put in work to go to the gym, right? Like it's a harder sell than it is to relieve a pain that's happening right now. So when you're looking for problems, think about it. Choose an aspirin, not a vitamin. The second thing is, is when you think about problems, uh, especially in the business I'm in, I'm, I'm doing a business to business, right? Uh, that's my company. And there's also business to consumer. When I do business, when you do business to business, um, a lot of times people are making business decisions. So, and it'll happen even with business to consumer, people will get multiple quotes. If you're offering a service, they're going to get multiple quotes from different people. If you're not you know, as differentiated. So I always say this, don't create, don't, uh, don't create a $20 solution to a $10 problem. So when you're being problem focused, you also have to think about the fact that, okay, this is what the problem is worth to somebody. This is what I think they're willing to sell. And if you can't create a solution that matches that or is under that, right? Because we want to make a profit here. We don't want to just break even, right? Then you have to think about how much your solution costs. You may come up with five solutions and you might not even pick the one that, that solves the problem in the best way. It might be the one that solves the problem enough and is inexpensive enough that it'll actually gain adoption. And then the final one is KISS. And this is an acronym. And it's keep it simple, stupid. Don't get too complicated. If you get complicated, complexity kills. And it makes things a lot more difficult, not just for you, but for your customer. So keep it simple. And when we're thinking about how we create a solution to the problem, I like to think, I like to think of it as this Venn diagram here, right? We need to create a solution that's desirable. So that means that your customers, it's something your customers really, really want, right? They, they really want it because it's just so cool or it just does this thing so well. But it also has to be viable. That means that you can, again, you can charge more money than it costs you to provide that service. So it's a viable business model. And then finally, it's feasible. It's your business. You have to be able to do it. So if it takes a, if it takes building a really complicated machine learning model and you don't know how to do that, then it's not really feasible for you right now. So you can't break laws of physics and you should be doing things where you feel somewhat, you feel comfortable enough that you can put a solution together that's feasible, right? And what we're trying to do is hit the middle of that graph, right? Desirable can create a viable business model and it's feasible. The next one, it, uh, I started out as an engineer and engineers, uh, oftentimes really like to think that they've, they, that they've got a really great solution to a problem, but then it hits the, hits the customer and the customer says, oh, that's not really my problem. This is my problem all over here. Right. There's a phrase that I learned that I think it was Christian Clayton who says, people are not looking for a quarter inch drill. They're trying to have a quarter inch hole, right? A drill is simply a solution to getting the thing that they actually want, which is a hole. So if you want to use a laser or a drill bit or a whatever, like that's what you that's what you're trying to do. So when you have your idea and and this business idea, right? And I oh mean, I think this might work. It's just an idea right now. Treat it like it's a hypothesis, right? It's something you need to go test and check against other people. So get out there and talk to people. It's also important when you're talking to people uh, to keep in mind that no one ever had an ugly baby. What does that mean? It means that you'll go say, hey, look at this solution. Look how cool it is, right? And there's a lot of people who say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Even though they may never have an intention of using it or ever, because they don't want to hurt your feelings. So it's important, again, not to just show them your solution, but to figure out how to, um, how to solve their problem. And this is the graphic I, I love that. It's, that's, that's nice, dear. That's the exact thing you don't want to hear from one of your customers. A little pat on the head and come back to me when you've got something that actually works. Finally, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because as I was putting my slides together, I saw that uh, Professor Eric Munson already talked in depth about the business model canvas, but I kept it in here because I think it's super important that this is not, this is a, an important thing that you need to think about, right? And uh, they make a really great book, the business model canvas, um, or 
I actually have it on my shelf, uh, Business Model Generation. It's a great book. It's not terribly expensive. If you're really interested in this, read it, take the lessons, and it's a super important tool and way to think about how to build your business. And so the only thing I'm going to add is to say that when you're on the beginning of your journey, you want to think about kind of the, the top right-hand corner of this. And this is value proposition. So it's the value you bring to your customer. And then on the right-hand side is your customer segments. And there's two things that you talk about, which is customer relationships you need to build. How are you going to communicate with those customers to tell them you have the coolest thing, right? And then the channels, which is how, now how are you going to actually deliver that service, right? So in our business, uh, we don't actually do any sort of uh, remote installations. We work with uh, end clients. But oftentimes there's a third party, an environmental consultant who actually is the boots on the ground who does a lot of the work. So what are the channels that we work with to help deliver our product to an end client, which is a wind company, is oftentimes a consultant, right? And they make money because they get paid to do that. And they also get paid to use the data in intelligent ways. And you have to think about how you're going to reach those customers. And it's not doesn't always just have to be you. You know, in a retail, think about a retail setting, right? You may have a cool widget, but you're going to have to have sell it at a store. Uh, you know, or maybe you do have a digital, uh, you know, storefront or something like that, but all those things require very different solutions, right? So you got to think about those things right up front. So in the beginning, really focus on the delivery of value to those customers. And then this is my final one. And I would always be remiss, uh, if I, if I didn't include this one, um, perseverance, right? As I said, if you're passionate about it and you believe it and you're problem focused, uh, you're gonna you're gonna probably find a way to 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 make it work, right? I'll also say it's only a mistake if you don't learn from it. You will make plenty of errors, and if, as long as you view them as learning opportunities and ways that you know how to do it wrong now, right? I think it was Thomas Edison that said like you know I I know uh, you know nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine ways to you know not make a light light bulb. Uh, that's true. You have to keep. Keep trying and keep trying. And as long as you are learning every time you make the mistake. Um, so this is what I share with everybody. Um, this is actually an email I got. So I was talking to you about the SBIR program. This is the second SBIR I put in. And this is the, uh, I regret to inform you letter, which is you didn't get the funding. And again, in the early stages of a company, not getting the funding can can be a, a life or death you know, sentence. So you got to pivot and you got to say, okay, what did I do wrong? I'm going to look at the reviews, what the reviewer said, yada, yada. And you have to learn from it. Again, only a mistake if you don't learn from it. And I would love to keep talking about this. And I'm sure John's got a few questions and you all have a few questions. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to turn it back over to John. Yeah. Thanks, bro. A lot, a lot there for sure. I, I still like the, uh, only, it being an only a bat, the only flying mammal I've always, that's, yeah. that's something I learned right off. But, the, you know, overall, I just, you know, you you and I have talked about this before, just the idea of finding a, um, a legitimate problem out there that needs a solution. And you had said something really interesting to me, like in your own, let's just say, you know, a student's looking to, to um, put forth a proposal for this contest. And in their head, you know, it's a great idea. It seems like there's, it, you know, it's a problem. You had suggested having students or anybody who's thinking of, of launching an entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial venture to ask people, go out and mm -hmm. ask people, yeah. um, experts in the field, if you will, Yeah, is, is this legitimately a problem legitimately and, and what, you yes. know, yeah. To talk a little bit about that because some kids are hesitant to do that, understandable, yeah. uh, but oh, you're totally. saying people love to talk about it. Um, yes. So I will tell you, it, um, if you find a problem that is that is like really worth solving people and you and you say hey i'm you know i'm i'm doing this and i think that i i'm trying to create a solution to this problem and it's something that you know touches a nerve with somebody and they say oh wow that problem really needs a solution i would love if someone could do that for me right they they will absolutely talk to you about it i'm going to tell you i did i was not comfortable excuse me networking was um a decade ago, I, you know, or maybe a little bit more than that. I was, I did not like it. I just didn't like it. And getting out and putting yourself out there is uncomfortable and it's okay to feel uncomfortable. Um, as if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to doing a whole bunch of things that probably make you uncomfortable. And for some people, networking comes really easily. And there are some folks who myself included, it was a skill that I had to learn. And then you eventually get comfortable with it. 
Um, so it's not like I'm going around knocking on every neighbor's door, you know what I mean? Or doing anything like that. And, but, um, you, it's something that I think it's a skill that you need to get comfortable with. Um, so, so, so think about that. And even if it's just starting a conversation, you know, pra- take small steps. You don't have to go and find a customer right away. It's just like those small steps, making small conversations. Maybe you find a, you know, we're in the holiday season. Maybe you find a, a relative at a party you're at and you, you know, maybe the one that you don't know as well. And you just find a way to connect with them. And then maybe you test your idea on them and see what they think. And, uh, you know, maybe don't take that data point, but use it as practice, right? It Networking and, and getting comfortable with getting customer feedback I was actually part of a, uh, as part of the DOE and NSF programs, uh, part of a uh, an entrepreneurial boot camp, and in six weeks, they require you to have over thirty customer interviews in in six weeks, and so it's a critical thing. And that's just and the, and they tell you like that's just the start. You know, this is this is the six week boot camp version. You should be having if you're starting a company, you should be having over a hundred of these. Because by the way, if you and, and don't talk about your solution when you're talking to them. Just talk to them about the problem. People love to talk about, you know, the, their experiences, right? And by the way, if you do end up coming for a solution with them, you've already got people who you know already have the problem. And they will be very comfortable when you come back in a year or six months and say, hey, by the way, that thing we talked about, I actually developed it. Would you mind testing it for me? And yeah. I'm going to say nine times out of 10, people are going to be like, absolutely. It solves the problem. You fe- Feeling listened to, Right. And being able to be a really good listener is an underappreciated skill. And people love to feel like they were listened to. So mm-hmm. super important. Yeah. No, that's helpful. A quick question here. I'll, I'll get to in a second. Just a quick follow up to that. Um, you know, you have, there's anecdotal evidence. You talk to people, you know, and you get ideas for people in the field. But what about it's anecdotal though? So, data wise, you know, you have, you have a, a, an issue, a problem you want to solve. And you want to find out, is it truly, on what scale is this truly a problem? Not necessarily, you know, five people said it was, whatever. How about just doing research on what you think you're about to solve and, yeah. and actually make a lot of money doing it, ideally, you know, and help people along the way. How about how about just research? I mean, what would you suggest to get legitimate data? Yeah. Um, so uh, even before I became an entrepreneur, I was lucky enough to uh, my previous company to they we went through this something called voice of the customer training, which yeah. is even something a developed company can use to understand what the features are that they want to put into a new product. And so with those sorts of things, it's talking about, you know, legitimately 30 to 60 people, you know, um, and now I will tell you this, there will be conversations you have. And there's just some people who aren't, um, there's some people who like to talk more than others. And some people who are more articulate, you might have 30 conversations and five of them might be stellar. And the others may be okay. And some might just be bad, <laughs> but yeah. like, so, you know, quantity in a lot of ways, you will find the quality ones just by doing the quantity of them. If you go and you talk to five people and you're like, I think I know what I'm doing. I'm going to tell you either you, you certainly could be, find a solution to the problem, but you're undervaluing what your problem is. Because if you talk to more people, you might find that, oh, wow, I can solve this even bigger problem, Right. And so don't settle for the first thing, right? Talk to those 30 people, even if you feel like, <clears throat> excuse me, you're not, you know, learning, uh, you know, something revelational with every conversation. Because when you get to the 30th, you're probably hearing a lot of repeat stuff. And, but that validation that it's, it's a, re- it's a repeating theme uh, and digging into it is an important thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, question in the chat box here. I think it relates uh, to what you, you started off talking about having passion I mean, you've got, you've just got to have passion for the, for what you're going to, this venture or just, you know, and th- this uh, particular question from a student about uh, basically just, you know, procrastinating and work, trying to work through this. I know I have a lot to do, but I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with, uh, they're struggling a little bit with kind of uh, overcoming this procrastination to, you know, in this case, it might be to, uh, you know, submit their application. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing it's tied, you know, if, if this particular student uh, does find uh, something they're passionate about to to submit this application yeah. that would light a little bit of a a fire. But any tips you may have on that, uh, feel free to yeah. share. Yeah, so it's a hard one. I, so I don't want to procrastination to me typically like when I find I'm procrastinating something, I'm doing something that I'm not comfortable with, and I don't know what the outcome's going to be. That's scary. You know what I mean? Like even to you know like 
I may have started this business, but it's not like I just, you know what I mean? Like there's still, there's still things that make you uncomfortable because they're new things that you're doing. And so typically what I find is procrastination, you're doing something that is out of your comfort zone. So give yourself a little pat on the back because you're doing something that's outside of your comfort zone and, and try to break it into the smallest incremental steps that you can, right? Just say, okay, I'm going to, um, I'm going to go work on this for 15 minutes. I'm set a sketch. I'm a big, and again, not everybody does this. But I'm a big proponent of scheduling blocks of time, right? If I, I you know, I'm going to get, I'm going to get home and from six to six fifteen, six thirty, maybe start fifteen minute increments. I'm just going to work on this. I'm going to put the phone away. I'm going to turn the TV off. I'm going to, I'm really going to like pick something and make progress, and then measure that. Pro- watch, you're going to see that you every. If you're doing that fifteen minutes, you're going to find that progress, and you, it's going to build the confidence. I'm going to say like I, I know that putting a pitch into this is probably a scary thing because you're putting yourself out there. It's an idea that you had, and and that idea is something that like and someone's going to. Someone's going to judge it, right? That is not the easiest thing. So, so validate yourself and say, yeah, this is, this is a hard thing I've been doing, but you know what? I think in the long run, it's worth it, right? And I'm going to work a little bit at a time and I'm not going to try to just get it all done in a three hour shot. Um, and I don't know. So that's, I, I work best based on time-based schedules, but. That's a great, that's a great tip. And I think helpful for students that are trying to get, you know, meet this, this January deadline uh, mm-hmm. to chip away at it in increments like that. That That's great. Yeah. Um, and speaking of, you know, I'm glad you brought up, you know, it is a personal thing. You're putting forth something about you. Yeah. Like, I think this is a good idea. This is me. And you, you showed your rejection letter, like not always pretty. So is- this leads to a question that a student asked me to ask you. Mm-hmm. Why do you think, because he threw out a number, and I'm not sure if it's accurate, but still uh, of something like a hundred uh, entrepreneurial ideas or pitches that are, that are given mm-hmm. only like three actually make it or turn into a, to a business. Well, yeah. that's true not the numbers low. Yeah. What do he, he the question was, why do you think so many um ideas, pitches, entrepreneurial ideas f- fail? Yeah. Because I mean, to, <laughs> it's it's hard. Uh, identifying a new problem that you have a novel solution for that, you know what I mean, like kind of other people haven't noticed and that is kind of in your wheelhouse is it's a hard thing. There's no doubt about it. I would say a lot of times the way that I and I think there's been some research done on this, but I don't remember any numbers. But I think honestly, a lot of it is, and that's why I focus so much on my presentation on this, is not being problem focused. It's saying, I just, I have this idea. I have a solution to a problem. And if there's anything that you want to do, by the way, what the, the solution, and again, I didn't have time to get in this. The solution that I have today for doing this at Wind Turbines is not at all what I pitched the first time to NSF. I had to pivot because I realized like, I, but I was for a long time, I was really stubborn and I was just like, man, like, I really feel like I should make this work. And sometimes you get into the trap of thinking that you should just work harder and that'll make it work. And sometimes you have to know that, no, it's just, I need to rethink. I need to fall in love with the problem, not my solution. The solutions. That's why I also like to think of everything as a hypothesis. It's just an idea you have right now, right? Treat it casually. I mean, be serious about it, but don't be like, this is definitely going to work, right? Because it might not, but you, but I guarantee by solving, if you come and you're trying to solve this problem, you're going to find a different way to maybe solve it instead of the initial one that you had. Um, I'd be interested just to hear, you know, I'm not, and again, I don't know what the stat is, but I'm going to guess a lot of founders will say like, the thing that I ended up doing was very different than what I thought, what I set out to do. So if you, so know when to, know when to hold them and know when to fold them and just know when to pivot, right? Like that's, and and that's okay. That's not a loss, right? Admitting that that your first idea wasn't the right one and 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 taking that turn and saying, I'm gonna do this a little bit differently is how you keep your business alive and how you keep the dream alive, right? And so don't don't hold hold those hold those ideas like very, very gently and be 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 willing to let them go free if they need to be. <laughs> I, I like that. I like thinking of it as a as a hypothesis that yeah. that then test, you know, yes. in different ways. Yeah. And like you said, maybe you find out uh, it's not really, and then you pivot to whatever it is. That leads to a quick question. So, if, so say a student is going to um, submit something by January mm-hmm. by the deadline, or when it, sorry, when it when it's open to uh, it's open for a while. So, um, and and they is there a way for them to sort of test it prior to uh, submitting? Because I could see it like they submit it, time passes, and they're like, oh, geez. Mm-hmm. 
I think mm. maybe I, <laughs> you know, I should have gone this way or whatever. Yeah. And there are ways to sort of like poke at it and, and get kind of test it early. Yes, there absolutely is. There's, so the the company that makes the um, business model canvas also makes another book called like testing business hypo testing business hypothesis, and and it can be as simple as you know what I mean, like just going out there. The first, I mean, the first thing you could be doing is going out and just making sure. Again, if you know the problem, and you know it inside and out, and you know, then you're you're ninety percent of the way to the right solution, right? The solution, you know will probably become apparent to you um, if you really know the problem. So just really understanding that space really, really well and having those conversations. And so I would say if you're trying to prepare and you're trying to keep everything fresh, it's again, it's those conversations, right? Like conversations are free. You know what I mean? Like spending 15 minutes or half an hour with somebody, if you can get them on the phone or you can just meet them in person, even better. Um, and, and having a conversation with them is that's the way you do it. And so it, it doesn't take, you know, a million dollars to do that. It just takes you feeling willing to, to put in the effort and to, to go do it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I had a student ask if you thought <laughs> the student likes to watch Shark Tank mm -hmm. and you know that you stand up there, you got five minutes yeah. and it gets shot down or they love it or whatever. Yeah. Um, do you think most, the question was basically, do you think most ideas, entrepreneurial ideas, um, when, when sort of presented like that, that some people that kind of know what they're doing in the field really could say, can tell that quickly, like, you know, yeah, no, that, that's a great idea. I'd invest in that. Or, you know, the, you know, the guy that always says, no, that's terrible. Get off the stage. Right. I mean, yeah. do you think most of them are, you know, for somebody to submit something, do you think it's something that uh, mo most people can tell who are professionals, you know, that it probably has a chance yeah. I mean, I, maybe, a, yeah, a chance. So here's the thing. It depends on like how specific, you know, something I, I will be honest, like we've had, uh, we've had our commercialization plans written when we do proposals for these things that have been, you know, kind of criticized for not being realistic. And I'm just like, well, we're kind of proving like it's some, sometimes it's so niche that like someone on the outside, like if, you know, you go up to a general person and you're just like, Hey, do you think a company that like focuses on monitoring bats around wind turbines would be successful? People are like, you're crazy. What are you even talking about? Get away from me. You know what I mean? Like, and so it, don't, if you, if you have an idea and, and you pitch it and you haven't talked to anybody else and you haven't verified. So that's the beauty. You can go on a shark tank, but if you've talked to a hundred people and they've said it's a problem and your solution solves that problem, it doesn't matter what that one person's opinion who may not be your target market, by the way. Right. So that's another thing that, uh, that professor Monson talked about market segments and target markets. Like who are you selling to? It may not be the person who's, who's on the other side judging them. They may not have that problem. And whether that's a, you know what I mean? Like where they live or like how they live or whatever, like it just may not be something they've ever encountered. I, so I tell you as a parent, like people, you know, if, if I didn't have kids, there'd be a whole series of problems I wouldn't know, you know what I mean? That I wanted a solution for, but I know that I want a solution to some problems, right? That And so I would not, if you rely on the data and the interactions you have with people who would actually buy the thing that you're, and and put your faith there, not in someone else who's going to judge who doesn't really who you. By the way, you pitch your idea for five minutes or something, and and someone's going to pass judgment. But it does mean that you need the data on the other side, right? If you're if you're going to be if you're going to have the confidence to not listen to somebody, right? Then you should have the data or at least in the own knowledge that this is something that's really going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up because I mean you you're right. You're like your field technically. You're, it, you know, it's an, it's a niche product, a niche yeah. field, a niche need, yeah. right? but it's needed. Obviously it's working. Exactly. It's a great point. Cause some students might think, God, it seems like a little bit of a crazy niche idea I have. Well, yes. I mean, it doesn't mean yeah. it's not needed. Exactly. It does not mean it's not needed. And it doesn't mean that there's, uh, you know, not someone willing to pay for the thing. You know what I mean? Like, and so, so again, but you got to find them. And you got to be confident that there's enough of them that you can do it. And then if you do that research and you find it, you should be confident in your research, not someone else's opinion. Because what yeah. they have is a hypothesis <laughs> and they don't oh, yeah. have the data like you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Believe in your own data. Exactly. Um, well, we're coming up a little bit on time. I just want to see if any other tips or things just kind of leave students with any a thought or two about 
you know, as they kind of there because it's getting down to crunch time soon, they're going to have to submit. And I know yeah. some close and, and any advice you may have to, to kind of close it out would be great. Yeah, no, I mean, I, again, I, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but really think about the problem that you're trying to solve. Right. And not, and not just your solution. So if you go in pitching, you know, to the, in, in this and you, and you say, here's the problem I'm trying to solve. Um, you're going to get a lot better response than here's the, here's the solution I have. And when someone asks, well, what problem are you trying to solve? Like, I don't know, but like, I got a pen that, you know, changes color whenever it's like, well, who's going to buy, you know what I mean? Like that's, you're really trying to solve a problem. Um, and so, so really focus on that to start and the solutions will come. Yeah. Let me squeeze one more. And prior to that, we have a question here about, and I think it's an interesting one because it says, you know, what would you say is a, a billion dollar idea? Well, if you knew that you'd be, (laughs) but, but it's a scale question. I mean, there, if your Mm -hmm. idea may, the market may be this size for your idea Mm -hmm. and that's, Mm -hmm. but if you're just like, I just want to make as much money as possible. That's a different thought process. And you're trying to, yeah. Yeah. I mean, is there any, any yeah. thought on that or do you just, are you just like stick with what, you know, chest? The I mean, yeah, it takes an exceptional human being to, and I am, I have no interest and in, I don't think I could deal with the pressure of running, you know, like running a billion dollar company or scaling a billion. It is, it's, it, that would be a pressure cooker because I will tell you this, as soon as you take, cause to make a billion dollars, you have to start with $50 million of somebody else's money. And those investors are going to expect results and your butt is on the line to deliver them. And, and so, I, so actually, I'm glad that you brought this up. I think sometimes people use the term like lifestyle business as a little bit of a pejorative. I, I don't really like the phrase because it makes it sound like, I mean, mine is a niche business and some people have called it a lifestyle business because it's not a billion dollar market and it never will be. And that's okay with me because I'm doing something that I love, that I'm passionate about that I can make a living at and that I feel like is making a difference in the world. And, and so know, know your why also of why you're starting a company. If you're starting a company to, to, to make a billion dollars, uh, you're on a totally different trajectory uh, than someone who is starting a business that maybe just says, Hey, I want to, the, the benefits of owning my own business and making my own schedule and, and trying to use my own wits to solve this problem you know what I mean? Like is very different than saying I want to make a billion dollars. Um, so I personally, if you want to make a billion dollars, go find that market. Um, right now, if you're not, if you're not an AI researcher, uh, out ahead of everybody else, like you're probably not going to make a billion dollars right now, but maybe you're, you've got the next big thing. Um, but I would say for right now, maybe you start, maybe your first business can simply be a $10 million business. <laughs> And then you can work up to a billion, right? Yeah, like Elon right. Musk didn't start Tesla and didn't start SpaceX. Like he started PayPal way back when I think a lot of the kids who were submitting were probably maybe not even born. Um, so it, it, it doesn't all just magically. I think actually another another great phrase is um, behind every overnight success is a company that's been at it for you know 10 years. Everything looks like it magically happened overnight. Right. Whenever it hits the press and whenever it's big, oh my gosh, chat GPT, like that, you know, oh my gosh, that's so huge. Right. People have been working on that for a while. Right. Like this isn't something that just sprung out that in the last year, someone just said, Hey, I got an idea. Let me not try this. Like this has been stewing for a long time. So um, maybe make your first business a $10 million and then your second business can be a billion dollar one. Yeah. No, that's good. I mean, that, that that's a reality check too, about the, the, you know, these things don't, don't happen overnight, but, mm-hmm. but the, the theme that you, that throughout the evening here, I think too, is, you know, the, the, the passion for what you think will uh, yeah. solve a problem and, and ideally help a lot of people. Um, yes. Well, and that's yeah. another thing I would encourage people to do, which is like, yeah, maybe, maybe you're not going to be a billionaire or a millionaire or whatever, but if you can go home at the end of the day and be like, I put in an honest day's work and I'm doing something that's actually helping people. Right. Like that's, that's, that to me is amazing. Um, and, and so think about that too, right? Like are, is what you're doing, you know, helping people. Yeah, that's, I think that's a, a great, a great place to leave it. Uh, cause I think that's, it's often overlooked. It is actually one of the criteria, mm-hmm. um, of yeah. the pitch challenges, you know, how, how, who are you helping, you know, yeah. during this. So, uh, yeah, I, I, we'll leave it there. I, we could talk all, all night about it, but I really yeah. appreciate, uh, the presentation, a lot of great insight. And if any students have any follow-up questions, I'll 
if you have any time and you're busy <laughs> schedule, we can uh, send them your way. And that's uh, great. Okay. Really appreciate right. it. Thanks, John. Thanks, Good luck, y'all. Yeah. Take care. See ya. Bye.